Let's hear it for Ron McGill. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Oh, I got a mic, right? You got it. Oh, okay, I got a mic. How you doing? Thank you very much. You know, I'm always very privileged to be asked to speak at uh, events like this because, quite frankly, I am a natural zoologist by training. I am not a photographer by training. I look at these guys like Flip, like Roman, you know, like uh, Michael, who were here earlier, and I think to myself, oh my God, I don't even belong on this stage. But here's the deal. Um, I started as a zoologist, I'm a naturalist, and the reason I got into photography was I'd start writing papers to get them published about different research I was doing, whether it was with cheetahs in Africa, eagles in Central America, whatever I was doing, to get them published. I sent in the articles and they go, hey, Ron, you gotta have some pictures to go with that. I go, okay, so I call the stock agencies. I say, oh, I like that one, that one, and that one. Can I get those? Sure, this is how much it's gonna cost you. I went, what? Are you out of your minds? The, the money cost to buy the stock images at the time, I would just buy a camera. So that's what I did, and I kind of taught myself to shoot. Never taken a photography class in my life. I'm gonna tell you that probably most of you out there know more about photography than I do. My big advantage with wildlife photography is that I know wildlife. I know how animals are gonna act, and I can try to anticipate behaviors, and that's probably the number one rule in wildlife photography, is know your subject. Get ready for what your subject's going to do. Uh, the other thing is luck. I know there have been a lot of photographers up here today, I've been listening to a lot of their presentations. Um, a lot of them say, well, there really isn't any luck if you know it. No, a luck has a lot to do with it, okay? And for every image I'm gonna show you guys, there's a thousand that have really sucked, okay? That's another thing I always wanted to do. I remember one of the first presentations I went to was a guy named Joe McNally, who was a, kind of a mentor to me. And I remember he went up and showed a bunch of images that really weren't so good. And he smiled and he smiled and I said, and he said, yeah, I shot all those images. Sometimes I think it's bad when guys come up here and they just show these incredible images and you sit there and you go, oh my God, what's it gonna take for me to get those images? You know what, it's gonna take just practice, shooting away and realizing that all of us up here, every single one of us up here have shot images that you guys have shot better images than those. Guaranteed, but we put these things together in a program to try to show you. So I'm gonna show you, not necessarily great images, but what the images are for. Because here's my number one mantra in photography. The first person who has to like the photograph is you. Don't worry about a judge, don't worry about something else. If you like the photograph, it's a good image. That's the bottom line, it's a good image. Can we make it better? Absolutely. We can get into different things, but you don't have to worry about everything being tack sharp all the time. We are storytellers. As photographers, we're storytellers. We want to inspire people to care about things. And I can tell you that the overwhelming majority of people you show an image to, if you show it to them and they go, ah, it's a good image. And that, then, then the minute they're going, huh, they're not going, oh, is it tax sharp? Let's see, is it the rule of thirds? They're not doing that, okay? The power of the image is that initial impression that you make. That's what makes a good image. Again, you want to start perfecting things? That's fine. That's what we're here for. But remember when everything used to have to be tax sharp? And then I tried to tell the story about Nick Nicklin years ago. Um, Nick, Nick Nichols, by the way. Uh, years ago, he took a, a shot of an elephant, a forest elephant, swaying back and forth in the dark. It's just this blur and a rear sink flash. They got these two beady eyes, look like devil's eyes on this elephant. And all of a sudden, it was on the cover of National Geographic. All of a sudden, oh my God, motion and blur is cool. Art Wolf did a whole book on blurry images that people would have thrown out 50 years ago, okay? But it's again, photography is subjective. What is the message you're trying to get across? My message is I want people to care about wildlife. That's all I want to do. I don't want to think about winning a contest. I want people to care. That's what we're doing as photographers. So, see if this works. Beautiful. Um, I'm very lucky. Why? Because I'm very tall. Except when I'm flying, that's when it's not lucky. But generally speaking, for photography, it's great because I got an overreach and things like this. I tend to shoot my favorite lens on the planet is that 200 to 400 f4. Why? Because I swear to you, when I was sleeping one night, the Nikon techs came into my room, they measured my arms, they made that lens because it fits perfectly right here. Being a long arm, I don't have to be strong at all. It sits right, it sits perfectly. I rarely, if ever, use a tripod. I am not a landscape photographer. I understand the purpose of a tripod, but I'm, I'm documenting wildlife. Cheetahs running, I mean, birds flying. I gotta be able to move around all the time. If I'm dilly-dallying with the tripod, it doesn't work for me. So I tend to shoot aperture priority. If I have time, I'll go manual. But I always keep my cameras when I'm moving in a, in a, in a Land Rover or wherever research vehicle I'm in at the time, I keep it on aperture priority. So the minute I pick it up, if something happens quickly, I'm not dilly-dallying, I got something. I got some, if I got time, then I'll go to manual and I'll work on manual. I keep it aperture priority and I usually try to keep it almost wide open because I'm usually dealing with animals pretty far away. And in doing so, it blurs out my background. It gives me the fastest shutter speed I could possibly have. This is what it gets the sharpest image I can have. I hardly, if ever, shoot below 800 ISO with these cameras today. 
Hardly if ever. Even if I got a great, I keep it at 800 ISO and I go as high as the 3200 regularly. Many of the images you'll see here today are 3200 ISO because you know what? It's better than 400 ISO film was 30 years ago. This ISO stuff is the greatest invention since sliced bread. The only thing better is digital photography. My God, the greatest invention ever is that delete button. You can shoot forever and ever and ever. If it stinks, you delete it. You have, you have you know, 128 gigs of film that's reusable. Do you know how many times when I used to shoot, I'd be shooting, I'd come home, my wife saw these rules of film, and all she hears is think, think, think. It was the transparency that I throw them in the garbage. She goes, what are you doing? I go, throwing it away. What are you doing throwing it away? Oh, they suck. They're no good. They're blah, blah, blah. Oh, my God. We're just, money was just leaking out like a sieve with film. And you only had 36 shots. You know, you, you, I shoot 36 shots in three seconds now. Three seconds. This new generation doesn't have any idea how lucky you are to be able to do that. Three seconds, 36 shots, and I can shoot a thousand and keep on going. And with wildlife, it's the greatest thing in the world because you'd be shooting all the time and you get to that 30, 31, 30, oh crap, I better change now because something great's gonna happen, I'm gonna be in my last roll of film. So this is the greatest invention that we have. The greatest teacher that you have is that LCD screen. That's the greatest teacher you have, folks, because you need to take the shot, you get instantaneous satisfaction. You look back there, you learn. Don't trust the LCD screen inherently because people look at it and say, oh, that's not so good. You'll be surprised when you see something on the LCD screen that you don't see until you put it on your computer screen. You go, oh my God, that's great. Most of the time, it's the other way around. You look at the LCD, oh, this looks great. You put it on, oh, crap, that's really blurry. I mean, it's, you know, that happens all the time to me. I can't tell you how many times, oh, this is good. I can't wait to see it. Oh, oh that's terrible. But the bottom line is, it teaches you about light, about shadows. The other thing is, a lot of times, I'll tell you folks, Try this every now and then. Try to shoot live view sometimes if you have the time to do so because you'll be surprised how your eye looks at composition differently when you're looking at it on the LCD as opposed to looking to the viewer. Because you're looking at the LCD, it's almost like you're looking at a framed image. You're looking at it differently. You'll see the composition will change. I've done that a lot. I found that it makes a little bit of a difference. And now to where I'm, where I'm looking through the viewfinder, it makes that bunch of a difference. All right, so here I am. I'm hand-holding. Again, I got to be able to move around all the time. Animals. Animals, you know, I'm always surprised when you're out on a sunny day and people think, well, I got a sunny day, I don't need any extra light. No, these speed lights today, I think it's the most underused tool in nature photography, even in beautiful daylight. Why? Because you get shadows a lot of times. And people think, well, you know, if I can't get really close to them, I'm not gonna be able to use the speed light because it's not gonna reach. You think it's not gonna reach, but it's gonna reach. This is an orangutan. Always gets those dark eye cop pockets, you know. He's, he's grumpy already because he knows I'm not using a speed light. He's not going to look good in the photograph. He's grumpy. This is a 500 millimeter lens. This is about 30 feet away, okay? Put on a little speed light. He's happier. You get a better shot. You see, you get the little kick in the eyes. Little kick in the eyes. You're painting in there. Understand what these speed lights are, folks. You're painting with light. That's what photography means. Painting with light. So you take those speed lights, you don't have to make it a flat, it's not like the, you know, the old cube flash or anything. These speed lights, you can tone them down, tone them up. I don't know the formulas. You have all these guys up here today, oh yeah, well that's uh, 250 at F8. I don't know that stuff. I look at my LCD, okay, that looks good, yeah. Or tone it up a little bit more, tone it down. I'm not that smart. You think, listen, I'm a Nikon ambassador and I'm, very, I'm embarrassed to say this. You think I look at the manuals? Those manuals scare me. They're a freaking encyclopedia of stuff that I just don't understand. So I, I don't deal with that stuff. I YouTube it. What is that? YouTube. There's it. Now he's explaining it to me like I can understand it. Boom. So that's what I do. So speed lights are really important, even in broad daylight, folks, because they fill in light. They give you a little bit more of a pop. Here's a classic example. This is a golden lion tamarind in the forest area. And what you have, if I didn't use a speed light here, he would look almost like a dull brown. But that light bounces off. It pops the flash in the eye. It makes a huge difference. This next image gives you even a better example. This is a black Gouldies monkey. See, the thing about animals is, there's a plus and minuses of photographing animals. The plus is they don't look at you. Do I look fat? Do I, look, I don't have to deal with that, okay? But the minus is you can't say, excuse me, turn a little bit to your left. Oh, can you move this way? The light's not hitting you. You've got to work around what the animal's doing. Here I've got a black ghoulies monkey, totally backlit, totally backlit. But I've got a speed light. Again, we're in the middle of the day. I've got a totally backlit monkey. Put that speed light on. The first shot stunk. It was not very good at all. So I dialed it up a little bit, dialed it up that, until I got the color that I want with the speed light. Boom. Now you've got... Speed light lighting up the front, lighting up the eyes, and you got actually nice rim lighting from the back lighting. The back lighting gives you a nice little highlight. Again, it's the speed light. You're painting with the light. It took me two or three shots before I got that exposure because I didn't know it automatically. I dialed up and down on the speed light, and it worked out pretty well. 
Sometimes you don't want to have a speed light. Sometimes people go out and they'll go photograph and it's this horrible overcast day like today. And they go, oh, this is so sad. I got no sunlight. I'm not going to get any color. No! That's a great time to shoot animal portraits. Why? If you go down, I come from Miami, you go down to South Beach and on South Beach, you see these models out there on a sunny day and stuff like that. And they pay these guys to put a big sheet over their heads to put them in shade, to put them in shadow, to cut out those hard shadows. That's what God has done when he's giving you a cloudy day. That's the time you want to go out and start shooting animal portraits. That's where you get the detail of the wrinkles on the face. Animals have personalities, folks. Every animal is different, no matter what you see. I've worked with them all my life, in the wild, in captivity. This chimpanzee, you can see her face. She's stinky, OK? There's a personality there. This is a different personality. You see, this one's a little more happy, a little more expressive. But they're just like people. Everything is different, no matter what you're doing. This is a very crummy. This next shot is a terrible picture but it sets up the picture I want to show you. Here's a shot of a gorilla. This gorilla, her name is Josephine. As a matter of fact, for those who've been watching the news, this is the grandmother of Harambe, the father, the, the uh, gorilla that was killed in Cincinnati. Well, this is her grandmother, his grandmother. She's still alive at our zoo in Miami. She had full cataract. She was totally blind. We had one of the top surgeons in the world, eye surgeons for human beings, fly in, removed her cataracts, and replaced them with human lenses. Gave her her sight back at 39 years old. This next picture is a picture I took the first moment she came out onto the exhibit. This is the power of photography. She came out onto the exhibit. She, we had to keep her locked up for three days in her night house. Because, you know, if you ever do surgery on your eyes to give you dilation, you, you always put on the dark sunglasses for a few days to give your eyes time to adjust. You can't tell the gorilla to keep the sunglasses on, so we keep her in a dark, uh, dark enclosure. But the first day we let her out, I'll never forget it. She looked, she went like this, and then she sat down, and she picked up a twig, and she stared at that twig, and I took this image at that very moment, and you can look at her eyes and read her mind, because what she's saying is, I can see. I can see as she looks at that twig. That's the power of photography. That ran front page color in the Miami Herald and a lot of other publications. I, and the quote and, and the caption was, I can see. That's what we can do with photography. We can, make, we can connect people to these things. We can't worry about things like barriers. I tell people all the time, listen, a lot of us can't afford to go to Africa, can't afford to go to Asia, India, Galapagos. Well, go to your local zoo. Go to the Bronx Zoo. Zoos offer a great way to practice on wildlife photography. Here's a classic example. This is a jaguar. Animals are creatures of habit. They go through routines. You learn their routines, even in the wild. I've watched animals. I watched leopards go on the same trail. You wait for this. You get ready. You anticipate the behavior. This is shot through piano wire exhibit. All you need to do when you've got some type of barrier like that is get your camera as close to the barrier as you can get it, and hope the animal has a little bit of distance away from the barrier, open up your f-stop as wide open as you can, and you rack focus it right out. You'll never see those barriers. You can really get some great shots, and just wait. As the animal's walking to you, what I do, man, is I put the hammer down. I just is walking because every little nuance, you never know. And then when you get back and you start looking at your images, that's when you get to pick. Oh, oh no. Oh, that was even better. And you just keep on going. It's like this wonderful Christmas time every time you're looking at all this stuff. Light is everything. You know, they talk about the golden hour, sunset, sunrise. This is a really nice shot, except for one huge problem, which I still make today. I do it all the time. He's got a flipping tree growing out of his head in the back. All I needed to do, folks, is just take two steps to the right, two steps to the left. One of the biggest mistakes we make in wildlife photography, we get so concentrated on the animal itself, we forget about it. I can't tell you how many type pictures I have of like lions with antlers and stuff coming out of their heads of branches, because you get so excited, you get the animal, you get in the shot. Do, 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 do. Just try to beware. And again, I've been doing this for years, I still make the same mistake. So I just wanted to show you. Great image would have been a lot greater if I just moved a little bit to the right or left and that tree could have been gone. You want to anticipate emotion. And I can tell, you know, when I watch, whether it be tigers, whether it be domestic cats, you can watch their ears, you can watch the tips of their tails, you watch their eyes. They're very subtle indications, but they are telling you what's about to happen. And that's when you need to be ready. Have your shutter down, get them in focus, ready to go. As soon as it happens, just let it go. Let your camera do the work. I'm gonna to explain to you an image that I got here a little while ago, and I remember, when I took the image, how bad I felt because the guy next to me made me feel like just garbage is what he made me feel like. Even if you don't like animals, look at patterns. Well, nature has this incredible patterns. The artwork of, of nature is just fantastic, whether it be lines, whether it be stripes, whether it be reticulated patterns. Feathers, oh my God, with feathers, you just look. Again, you don't even have to like animals, but look at the art that nature provides you. Feathers, it's real important to use speed lights when you can. Why? Because light is what creates a lot of the color in feathers. For instance, people don't know this, but blue is not a pigment that exists in birds. Anytime you see the color blue in a bird, it's refracted light. So when you use a speed light, you're gonna pop that blue even more, no matter what you're doing. 
Same thing here. Get a little pop in the eye. That green under the throat of that, that uh, bird of paradise would be black had I not used the speed light. Okay, so it's refracted light, and it's real important to use that. Sometimes you don't want to use a speed light. Again, there's no all or nothing rule, and it's whatever you like. But this mandarin duck, he's courting his girlfriend. You see her sticking her head out right behind his butt there. And this great little beam of light was coming right through the canopy of the area. And he's sitting there going, hey, baby, how are you doing? What do you think? And if I use the speed light here, I'm going to be lighting up that foreground. It's just going to flatten the picture out a little too much. Here I got this great beam of light that I think highlights him. It's like, oh, you know, the, the beam of light coming through is perfect for him. Another classic example, king vulture. Remember, animals are creatures of habit. They go through routines. If you observe them long enough, you can anticipate a behavior. This vulture would go to this one area every evening. Why? Because first time in the morning with first light, when the first beam of light came through the canopy, it lit him up like that, you see? Now what I did here is I go manual. Because if I went normal exposure, you're gonna see a lot of the green of the forest behind him. But by going manual, I can stop it down when you Photographing white animals and black animals. Remember, you're going to compensate for that. I'll show you that in a little while. But so this is where you start painting. This is where the first shot was terrible. But he's sitting there. He's good. I got time. Go manual. Go down. Oh, that's nice. Well, that's, well, I tend to like to underexpose pictures because I think it gives them more warmth. It gives them more depth. Um, speed now. We got this. This is 3200 ISO. This is at the Tampa Aquarium. It's a leafy sea dragon. When you go in aquariums, they don't let you use flash. They don't want you to use a speed light. It startles the fish or whatever. You, plus, you get the reflection of the glass. It tends to be a little bit of a challenge. This leafy, I'm saying, oh my god, i got to get a picture of this guy. He's fantastic. What I like to do is I take a wide-angle lens, and I use a rubber, uh, what do you call those things? Lens hood. Lens hood. Thank you very much. See, I don't, I don't belong up here. Lens hood goes on the edge of that thing. And you take the rubber lens hood, and you can put it right up against the glass. You see? And you put it up against the glass. You wait for that leafy sea dragon to come in a frame, and just the Tampa Aquarium used that for the cover of their calendar. I couldn't believe it. 3200 ISO, leafy sea dragon. Again, minimal. As a matter of fact, you see more light there than I saw with my naked eye. The cameras today will see more light. You'll take a shot with your cameras. You put them up like 6400 ISO, take a picture of something, and it's like, holy crap, there's a lot more light there than I can even see. That's the magnificent of these cameras today. Shooting through glass. If you go into aquariums and stuff, it can be a little bit of a challenge, but listen. Worry about reflections. That's all you got to be concerned about. Just go a little bit off to the side. You go off to the side, you'll be surprised how you don't get the reflection in the glass. And you know what? You don't need to use the top-notch cameras either all the time. You can get great pictures going off the side with little point-and-shoot cameras. The, the animals often, a lot of times, are curious. They'll come in. Just take the picture, folks. You'll be surprised. You will surprise yourself. And the more you do it, the more you'll learn, the better you'll get. Again, this is right here at the Bronx Zoo. I took the Oh, the, the, straw, the, the speed light off the camera and shot it from the side. This is light coming in from the side, right through the aquarium. Works out pretty well. Many times you want to make sure you have some kind of barrier between you and the animal, okay? But what I'm trying to point out here is what I did was the perspective. So many people always shooting like this. Shooting. Get down on the ground. Perspective is so, so critical in making your image different from someone else's, or at least showing the power of the image. This is a king cobra. This is the largest venomous snake in the world. I don't want to shoot down at this guy. I want this guy to be at my eye level even higher. I'm on my belly here. I shot the strobe from the bottom, uh, shot it up on an angle from the glass, and you can get a shot like that. It's very easy. So many people always want to get animals in an aggressive look. I can tell you, anybody who's been on safari, anybody who's even been to the zoo, you know an animal starts to yawn, and what do you hear? Everybody wants to get that shot with the teeth, because most of these shots that you see like this are yawns, okay? But it's okay, I guess it's the message you want to get across. It's a bad message, but the reality is, most, more often than not, it's yawns. I talk about patience. Patience is the number one trait you need in wildlife photography. This next image was the greatest test of patience I ever had. I waited a total of 16 hours for this image. We had the largest clutch of Komodo dragons outside of Indonesia hatching out of Miami for the first time ever. It was huge. And when it's a little over eight months of incubation, when they start to hatch out, they start to make a they have an egg tooth on their nose, and they start to cut the slit, which is like a leathery skin on the egg. And I saw that happening. Oh my God, it's getting ready to hatch. I got to document this. This is back in film days. So I took the egg out, I put it on a velvet cloth, and I put three speed lights around. I had my camera around, and I sat and I waited. I said, okay, I'm going to get this guy. Okay, so I waited eight hours. He popped his head out. I go, okay. Boom, I hit the camera. The speed lights went off, and what happened? He went back in the egg. He went right back in the air, oh my God. Okay, so now I realize I got a problem. I realize that I got one shot. He's either gonna blow out or blow in, but I got, I got one shot. This is not gonna be one of these do -do 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 shots. And this is back in the film days. So I'm waiting, so now he's coming out. And this is where you start, okay, when's, when's the time? When's the time? And what we do as photographers, at least I do it all the time, I try to envision the image I want before it even exists. 
And I said to myself, I want this lizard coming out. I want one foot out of the egg like this. I want him to the side, and I want his tongue coming out. Okay, I'm, I'm, I, I do this all the time. So all of a sudden, his head comes out. I say, okay, okay, okay. No, I wanna, and you want to press the shutter so much, you think, okay, I got to get one in the can, but I know it could blow up everything. And then finally, the foot comes out. Oh, God, this is working out perfectly. Okay, okay. And then he starts flicking the tongue. As soon as these lizards hatch out, they start flicking their tongue a lot because they're examining the new area. They have an organ in the roof of their mouth. They're collecting little organisms we can't see in the air, and they're depositing it in that mouth. And, he's, and he starts doing it every three seconds. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, tongue flick. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, tongue flick. Okay, okay. And then you just hold your breath. You go, okay, one Mississippi, tongue flick. Ah, all the straws go off. He blows out of the egg. It's done. I got one shot. But I got to roll up the film and I go down to the freaking extra cone place. I go, okay, develop this. He goes, okay, come back in an hour. I go, no, I'm going to wait right here. You tell me as soon as that's done. And the guy comes out, I'll never forget it. What a creep. He goes, I'm sorry, man. I go, and I look at it and I look at it. I'm looking at it. Boom! It was perfect. Okay? You can look at his eyes and you see the three little dots in his eyes. Everything went perfectly. That day was 16 hours, guys. And it was worth every second of it because that image was on the cover of so many different Hurt magazines and, and conservation magazines. And it was that very moment, the very first Komodo dragon hatched out at the zoo. This is the reward of photography. You cannot pay me enough money to not have had that experience. So it really is great. Baby animals. People love baby animals. Again, patience, folks. Show that combination of animals. This was another four years. Um, four hours after that baby was born, how the mother looked at the baby, how the baby looked at the mother. Again, creating that compassion. Even, you know, quick, whimsical type of images. This is an image here of this rhino right after it was born, and then it went out to go on exhibit the next day, and it had rained that day, so there are big puddles on the exhibit. Anybody who's had kids, can you ever walk a kid past a puddle? No, they seem to always want to stamp on the puddles. Animals are the same way. Kids are kids. These are the great parallels you see working with wildlife and seeing how humans are so similar to them. He went out that next day, the first thing he found was that mud puddle. And he's like, yeah, baby, this is great. He's just gone to the mud. And I mean, really got into it. Like, got the, oh, my God, this is so much fun. Oh, I'm going to roll around in this. This is just so much fun. And he didn't realize he was being photographed. He looked at you. That's right. I'm bad. I'm bad. He just looked at you. <laughs> it's just a great feeling to get that kind of experience when you're working with these animals. Here you see a baby hippie, pygmy hippo. This is right after it was born. This is the size of a football. Such a massive, massive animal gives birth to this animal to see how gentle it could be, to see when it sleeps and then it comes up and you, okay, I call it a kiss. Whatever it is, it's the most gentle thing in the world. This is the power of photography. It makes people understand animals better. That's my job. Not that everything's perfectly sharp, not that we're in the rule of thirds, but that people look at it and they go, oh my God, that is really, really adorable, really cute. This is the image I want to tell you about where I felt like I, I was never going to be a photographer in my life, right here. I was here, this giraffe had just been born, and I knew that the mother was going to clean this giraffe, so I knew that she was going to come down and start licking, cleaning the giraffe, you know, to get the classic kiss shot. And I was next to this guy, and I don't mean to offend anybody, I'm just going to, I hate to paint with a broad brush, but let me tell you what this guy looked like. Big guy, had about $100 million thousand dollars of equipment on a Gitzo tripod in front of me. He had the hat with all the pins and the vest with all the patches of every place he'd been all the way around the world. And he sat there with a big mustache, and he sat there, and he's waiting. And I saw that draft come down, and I just went, I was so excited. And he went, click, and he looked at me, and he went, what the hell was that? And I'll never forget for as long as I live, he goes, son, when you become a real photographer, you'll know the precise moment to press the shutter instead of that spray and pray garbage that you're doing. Ooh, and I felt this big. I felt so tiny. I go, I'm going to suck. I'm never going to be able to be a photographer. So I'm chimping through my images, and I see that where the tongue came out for one split second. I go, oh, God, look, did you get that one? And he looked at it, and he was pissed, and he walked away. So here's the deal, guys. <laughs> Let your equipment do that kind of work. You be prepared, because you remember, if you saw it, you missed it, okay? Let the equipment do the work. You have the delete button, you're not paying for film, you don't have to worry about that stuff. Don't be so proud to not let this amazing equipment do what needs to be done to get it done. Here's a great example of a shot where you think you've got the shot, and it's not over. We had this giraffe that had been orphaned. It had to be hand raised. So I had to get the shot. I get down with a wide angle lens, use a little fill flash, get the shot. I think I got the shot, right? Okay, we're done. I got the camera around my neck, wide angle lens, and I take the keeper. We're walking out, and all of a sudden the baby giraffe comes behind me and plants a kiss right on her cheek. I didn't even have time to pick up my camera, but thank God I got a great autofocus and everything else because I just put my hand on the shutter with it still on my chest, and I just went like this. I said, Oh God, I hope it's in some part of the frame. Okay? The bottom line is it was, and that was the picture. Okay, that's the image. It's a split second that you don't expect. You're not, you're not waiting for it, but it's there. So you've got to remember, it's never over till it's over. Now, getting to Giraffe, a lot of times I've been able to work with some fun people, too. Shaquille O'Neal is a good friend of mine, and uh, got to meet him when they won the 2006 championship down in Miami. And he loves animals. 
The problem is he's afraid of animals. And I say this, and he knows I talk about him this way. He's the biggest teddy bear in the world, but he loves animals. So we had a giraffe born. I said, Jack, come on. you got to come out and get this giraffe. I want to get this picture of you and the giraffe. It's going to be a great little juxtaposition. He goes, okay. He goes out. This baby giraffe is literally two days old. It doesn't even have any teeth yet. It goes, oh, is it going to bite me? Is it going to bite me? Is it going to bite me? I'm going, is it going to bite me? I'm, Shaquille, sit there and put your arm around it. Take the picture. Okay, okay. So he takes the picture. We take the picture of Shaquille and a giraffe. Okay. Not a great picture. Chain links in the back. I couldn't be selected, but it was fun. We put it on our website. The people loved it. But then I said, Shaq, you know, you can help out in conservation. Again, the power of, pop, uh, of, 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 of photography. We as human beings are primates. The smallest primate in the world is called the mouse lemur. It's found in Madagascar. Okay. Madagascar is going through a terrible problem with its endangered species. It's a highly endangered species. I said, we got to raise awareness for that mouse lemur. So I call Shaq up. I go, Shaq, here's the deal. I got this idea. We are primates. You are the largest freaking primate I know, OK? <laughs> so I want to get a shot with you and a mouse lemur, the smallest primate in the world with the largest primate in the world. What's his first question? They go by me? They go by me? <laughs> no, no. So I, I got him down. I said, Shaq, OK, this is what I want you to do. I want you to hold it. I want you to put it next to your face. I used a couple of hot lights on it. And I said, and I just want to give, give me the mouse lemur eyes. And we took this shot. <laughs> we actually made a little poster of that. You know what? And it raised a substantial amount of funding for helping Madagascar and helping conservation. But you see, that's the power of photography. You don't have to be a conservationist. You don't have to be, but you make a connection. Then we did another one to show the power. Of, he has a big Superman tattoo. And I said, Shaq, put it on your bicep and give me the, give me the look. Give me the Shaq look. So he gives me the Shaq look with the little mouse lemur on his bicep, OK? But you see, this is what you do with photography, folks. We, are, we have such a gift in this hobby because every time you take an image like this, it's an image that will never happen exactly that way again. And every minute you get away from that image, it becomes more valuable. That's why we got to keep on doing this stuff. This next image is really important to me because this is a dear friend of mine. She had been maimed by an orangutan, almost had her arm bitten off. I was there when it happened. I went with her to the hospital. She had plates and pins put in her arm. And I remember seeing her in the hospital bed after surgery. And she looked at me crying. She says, I don't think I can do this anymore. I'm not cut out for this. And I looked at her. I said, Stephanie, you are cut out for this. I know what a great vet you are. I've seen what you've done. You've dedicated your life to saving animals. I'm going to prove you're cut out. I'm going to take you to Africa. I took it to Africa with me. And I had her work on a cheetah project, this conservation project that I was working out there. And she worked with the top vets and everything. And bottom line is we found this one cheetah that had survived after the mother and siblings were killed on a ranch by a farmer who thought cheetahs were predating on his livestock. This cheetah was in horrible condition. She was out there in South Africa with me. She worked with that cheetah day in and day out for two weeks. Everybody said, there's no way you can save this cheetah. It's too far gone. She saved that cheetah's life, that cub's life. This is a shot I took when she went into the pen. She didn't even realize I was photographing her. And I stood away, and I took this picture of her. And it's the cheetah that she saved, OK? And she still has that framed, and she said it changed her life. She said, you're right. She had tears in her eyes. I am cut out for this, because that cheetah would never have lived, nor would many other animals that she's worked with. She's one of the finest vets I know. But that's the power of photography. That's a moment she will never forget. We can never take enough photographs, folks, ever, ever, ever. Here you see kids and animals. Oh my gosh. Every time you get this wonderful thing with kids and animals, that actually won the Parade Magazine photo contest one year. Uh, this little girl going in, this little Annie Hall outfit. And to see these kids, when they haven't been taught to be afraid of something, this wonderful wonder that they have. That's the greatest thing. This innocence that children have in this wonder with wildlife. We need to teach kids to respect and appreciate wildlife, not be afraid of it. You know, when I grew up, there was a show that I watched every Sunday night, 7.30, Wild Kingdom, OK? That taught me to appreciate nature. You look at the crap that's on TV today, a lot of this stuff, when animals attack six, the river monsters, you know, the death of We're teaching kids to be afraid of the outdoors, be afraid of nature. It's the wrong message. We can teach them to be a wonder of nature. I've been so fascinated with nature all my life, and all this stuff has been possible for me. This next kid, I took this picture of him. His mother was freaking out. Oh my god, it's going to bite him. I said, it's not going to bite him. Just let him look at it. Let him be in wonder. This is a kid who's in wonder of this animal looking at him. These are the connections we got to build. This is the future generation. Here's a classic example of an adult who's totally afraid. This is a cardiac surgeon. We do gorilla physicals on an annual basis. This gorilla has hypertension, so we have a human cardiac surgeon come in and examine him. This gorilla is out like a light, OK? He's got more anesthetizer in him than anything in the world, anesthesia in him than anything in the world. This doctor never believes it. He, you can look at his face. He's very nervous, OK? <laughs> so I accentuate the photographs just by taking a wide-angle lens, getting closer to the gorilla's head, which makes his head look a lot larger than it really is. Take a little flash off the top, shoot the picture. Another front page in the Miami Hill shot of the cardiac surgeon who thinks that Kong is coming back to life, OK? <laughs> This is the fun we can have. I love pictures like this. This is a hand surgeon who had to repair the hand of a, of a chimpanzee that was in a fight, broke it in seven places, and he's, he's lining up where all the wires are going to go, the pins in, that, in, the, in the animal's hand. I just thought the juxtaposition of the human hand helping the, uh, the gorilla hand, the chimp hand, was great. Remember I told you
told you about perspective. Here you see an image where they're doing some work on the, on the feet, on the claws of a lioness. And all the news is in there, and they're all trying to get the picture of them working on the lioness claws. Well, you know what? I'm very tall. I'm not standing on any type of bench or anything here. I'm just standing like this with a wide-angle lens shooting straight down, and I get a different perspective of the entire surgery suite, of the trauma room. So you see all the people are there, all the people are concentrating on what's going on in there, but I'm showing the scene. And that's the thing I think we pass a lot on in photography. We forget to show the environment of where we're at and what we're seeing. The other thing about going to places is sometimes you can watch, like in a zoo, if you're lucky enough to be there when an animal is born or hatches out, this flamingo hatched out right in front of me. I just happen to be lucky. This is luck. This is luck, okay? Hatched out, watch it get up, stand up, do the whole thing. You can go back, you watch it hide in its mother's back, you come back day after day, you can see it feeding its mom, you watch it grow through its ugly phase, then you watch it get into the part where you're introducing it back to the flock, then you see how keepers can care for it, it's a whole story. We tell a story with our images. It's photo essays. Not one of those images that I ask you about, is it sharp, is it through that? No, we're telling a story. That's the most important thing, that you convey your story. Here you see a beautiful image. I was very lucky with this image. Actually, it won a big international photo contest. It was cover of several magazines, and people say, wow, that's a great image, right? All the technical perfection of that image, this next image is just imperfect and horrible, technically speaking. And yet this next image has made me more money than any image I've ever shot in my life. And when you look at this image, you'll say, well, it's really not a very good, but I bet you you smile. <laughs> These flamingos, this is in 1992, Hurricane Andrew coming through zoo. And we had to catch all the flamingos, and we catch them all up out of the lake, and we put them into the private bathrooms, the public restrooms in the zoo. Why? There's no windows, tile floor, you can keep it clean, and this and that. I always keep like a little cool pics on my hip, so all of a sudden, I look back and I go, oh, that's ridiculous. So I just listened. I didn't even frame it. I just went, I took a picture and I walked away. Well, then Hurricane Andrew comes through, destroys everything. And people are asking, anybody have anything different other than a house broken down or a car flipped over or somebody standing in the street crying? I go, you know, I got an interesting image. Let me send this out. Two-page spread in Newsweek. And it turned into this viral thing, and even though that was before things were viral. But I mean, it's gone everywhere. Restaurants have bought that image from me on South Beach. And you know where they put it? in front of the urinal. So when guys are sitting in the urinal, you got the picture of the flamingo standing in front of the urinal. <laughs> I mean, it's gone all over the place. An image that's not technically perfect. So the lesson here is, guys, don't miss the moment because you're caught up in all the technicality of photography. I don't think most of us are here to make money with photography. I think we're here to make memories. And how do we make the best memories? How do we make an image every now and then that we want to frame and put on the wall, make maybe a little photo book that we can show our family? That's what I think most of us do here. We're not out here to make a living doing it. For those of you that are, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm never going to help you out because I'm not going to show I'm just going to tell you how to have fun with this stuff, okay? Storytelling. This is one of the most poignant stories I've ever told in my life. And ironically, as much stuff as I've done in the wild, it was in captivity that this story happened. This is the first lion ever born at the zoo. Oh my God, I'm so far behind. Um, first lion ever born at the zoo. He was the only one, one in the litter. Very strange. The mother was very young. She could not take care of him very well. We had to actually give him milk. We had to supplement him with milk. And there were many times we thought he was going to die. He had all kinds of physical problems, but we got him over the hump. You know, we announced it when he was born. It was all over the media. Everybody was, oh my God, how's Quasi doing? How's Quasi? Oh, it looks bad, looks bad. We don't know if he's going to make it. Very poor chance. And all of a sudden, oh my God, he's going to make it. We're going to have this day where we announced we're introducing him out to the exhibit with his mom. All the media was there. All the public was there. It was this huge following in South Florida. The first lion bonded to zoo. He's coming out with his mom. It was a beautiful thing, man. They went out together. Everybody was like, oh my God, this is so cute. I mean, people were crying. When I say that, I am not exaggerating. They were crying, watching this mother with his son, taking the pictures. She'd grab him. She'd grab him the little instant. She'd hug him like this. And everybody's like, this is the greatest story ever. Quasi, which means warrior. He survived. He's out with his mom. Kumbaya. Everything's great. And two days later, two weeks later, Mom died. And it was heart-wrenching, folks. It was heart-wrenching. What was even more heart-wrenching was to hear him crying for her. He would just cry and wail for her. The fortunate thing, if there is a fortunate thing about this, is that Labari's sister, Kashifa, had a litter of cubs three months after Kwasi was born. And she had four cubs. And because lions are social, we thought we'd introduce them together. Maybe she'll accept, adopt Kwasi. And sure enough, she did. So it was great. We got him out, and we put him out on the exhibit together. We said, oh, there's more happiness to this story after the sadness. We we're going to put out Kashifa with her four cubs and Quasi, who she's adopted. The thing about Quasi was he seemed like he was so nervous, he didn't even want to lose her. He got to her, and he, I, don't, I know it sounds anthropomorphic, but I really felt in my heart, he said, oh, my God, I don't want to lose her. He never left her side to the point he was a pain in the neck. He would be next to her all the time. She's like, leave me alone already, all the time, going back and forth. Even when you saw her walking, 
Her cubs, her blood cubs, would try to follow, but he'd always get in front of them. See, the little blood cubs, the smaller ones, they're three months younger. So, and he's like, no, no, she's mine, she's mine, she's mine. And he'd be a pain in the neck. The, the real cubs would be in the background, and she'd always be swatting with him. Mom, come on, I want to play, Mom. Oh, my God, will you leave me alone? Please leave. Oh, my God, leave me alone. It was just unbelievable. But then you see Mom just cuddle him, and she'd groom him, and she'd take care of him. And you're going, this is fantastic to where it was just the perfect family. This here she is with her. You see Quasi, how much bigger he is than her four blood cubs. But she protected him, and Quasi was always the one closest to her, as if to say, I'm never going to lose her. I'm not going to lose her, but here's the big problem now. We want to introduce the male, who is the father of the four cubs, but not Quasi's father. Anything, anybody who knows about lions knows that lions will instinctively, males will instinctively often kill cubs that are not theirs, because they only want their genes to go on to the next generation, and they also want to make sure that they can get the female in season right away so they can breed them. So we thought, okay, this might be offset by the fact that those are his cubs, so he doesn't necessarily want to breed her again. He wants to take care of his cubs. We put them together side by side in the back area with a, uh, a barrier between them, and he was loving his cubs, and he didn't pay any attention to Quasi. So we said, okay, we're going to try this. Three weeks we did that, that introduction. But we knew if something went wrong, it would go wrong instantaneously. There's nothing we can do. So we're taking a huge gamble here, but we had to do it because it was important that this lion be raised as a lion with a male in the pride. So we put him out an exhibit, and Lord have mercy. As soon as the male came out to join him, he went right at Quasi. I'm taking this picture. This is as it's happening, folks. I'm realizing that I'm about to photograph infanticide. Here's, Quasi, here's a, um, Kabar, uh, Jabari coming right at Quasi to kill him. He's coming to kill him. Quasi runs as fast as he can. He runs right to where his mom is, right behind the, uh, the log, and he screams. And the, the lighting's terrible here. It's midday. It's horrible lighting. Who cares? I'm telling a story, OK? He screams. As soon as he screams, his mother hears him. His mother turns around, and she goes at, at Jabari, and she goes, don't you touch him or I'll kill you, OK? <laughs> Jabari goes back. He's urinating all over himself, like, OK, man. And he runs away. I'm serious. He runs away. It was unbelievable how he ran away. And the next thing, she looked at him, and she growled him. And he sat, she growled him, and he sat down on his side like this. And I'm telling you, folks, it was amazing. Because within several days, when Kwasi came over to Jabari, Jabari then embraced him, OK? It was hard to believe how you found out who wore the pants in that relationship right away. <laughs> but this next image is one of my favorite images ever taken. Because let me tell you the context in which it was taken. It was taken right after um, Kashifa confronted Jabari and growled at him and saved basically um, Kwasi's life. Kwasi ran away, ran under a tree, and he was trembling in the shade of the tree like this, looking at her. She realized she just let Jabari know what she thought of him, and she realized he was not going to be an issue anymore. She turned around, she saw Kwasi trembling, and she slowly started walking toward him. And I said, what is going to happen here now? Is she going to reassure him what's going to happen? And I'm telling you folks, I'm not making this up. You look at the image. She went up to him. She put her head against his. She put his ar her arm around him. She pulled him closer as if to say, don't worry. I will always take care of you. These are the moments that you never forget. These are the rewards, the rewards of photography, an instant that will never happen that way again. But every time I see it, I remember being there. I remember tears filling in my eyes. I remember my hair standing up. This is the beauty of wildlife photography. Now, we talked about perspective. I'm going to go through this real fast because I'm really like, what the heck was that? <laughs> anyway, OK. Perspective, right? Here you see an image. Look, guys, this is terrible. You know why? Because I got that thing lined up where the dark is above and the light is below. It's disturbing. Just squat a little bit. Boom! Makes a better image. It's just moving just a few feet, not even a few feet sometimes. Squat a little bit. Here's this meerkat. It's a busy background. Meerkats will follow you around if they're playing sentinel like that. So get his attention. Keep moving till you got a cleaner background. Bingo! It's really easy. It's so simple. It's all about perspective. This is my best example of perspective. Here you see Ibis on the beach, right? The sun, got the light. Everybody always wants to shoot with the light behind you, looking right at the animal like that. So it's, like, it's a nice shot. But what would happen here if I stood up, same birds, same place, same moment. I stood up and I walked around on the other side, opened up a little bit. This shot looks totally different, OK? It's all about perspective, folks. Just move around, do different things. We talk about cameras, and everybody wants this gear, right? This gear that's going to get you close. Listen, most of us can't afford these $10,000 lenses. That's ridiculous. But the resolution that your cameras have and a good sharp lens, you can crop and still make good images, still make publishable, publish, publishable images, even with the most discerning of editors. Here's a shot, full frame shot. What I did was I cropped it down to this like this. It was good enough for the cover of a pretty good magazine. Okay. Again, you can crop and still do it. We do it all the time. Don't think you have to get the full frame shot. This is classic example, subjective photography. I'm going to tell you the story of this at the end of the show if I got enough time. 
This is in Botswana, Okavango Delta. He's coming across, 3,200 ISO. I'm like, do, 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 do. I look at this. Oh, I love this image. Look at that. The reflection, everything. The water splash, the tails. There he's looking right at me, coming right at me. This is beautiful, right? I want to send this out. Somebody's going to want to publish this. Sure enough, I get a note from Shutterbug. It's going to be our cover. Boom! I got the cover of Shutterbug. I'm so happy. I'm so excited. I can't wait to get Shutterbug because I'm so in love with this image. I'm so proud of the composition of this image. So I'm waiting for my Shutterbug to come in. And all of a sudden, my Shutterbug comes in. I open it up. I hate editors, okay? <laughs> but the lesson here, folks, remember, photography subjective. I was just so happy to have my name on a byline on the cover of Shutterbug. That's all it was for me, because I'm not doing photography to make money. I'm doing photography to get people to care about nature. That's what it's all about. Then we get outside. You know, I've been very lucky. I live down in Miami, so I'm out in the Everglades all the time. And folks, I'm going to go through this really quickly. But folks, here in New York, Central Park, anywhere, the Adirondacks, you've got so much wildlife, so many beautiful things. Remember when you're shooting white birds, don't keep your auto meter on an auto. You're going to have to open it up a little bit. You've got to get more light in there. Because remember, your meter's always trying to make everything that, what is that, 18% gray? Is that what they call it? I don't know the technicality. But it's always, it always tries to balance for an 18% gray. So if you're shooting a white bird, and it's the predominant part of your, 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 your frame, it's going to look like a gray bird, unless you open it up a little bit. And the opposite goes for black. Look for things like reflections and things like that. This is just a lot of fun. I love working with reflections. They make a lot of fun uh, working with these animals out in the wild. So, this is a project that I worked on. If anybody's here tomorrow, I'm doing a conservation talk. I'll tell you the in-depth story about this, but it's fantastic. Here I am studying eagles, harpy eagles in Panama. Anybody knows our bald eagle, right? Great animal. Everybody talks about the bald eagle. Well, let me tell you something. The harpy eagle makes the bald eagle look like a pigeon, OK? No, oh, no, there's no joke. This is the largest, most powerful bird of prey in the world. I've watched harpy eagles at 50 miles an hour take full-grown sloths out of trees in the canopy and keep on flying like a freaking F1 fighter. Unbelievable birds. So I'm doing this study, going to the rainforest with these birds. It's fantastic. You get in a rainforest, folks, and it's just this endless, it's an endless canvas of photography. And People are always looking for the big animal. I want, where's the jaguar? Where's the anaconda? Where's the... No, folks, look around you. Look at the plant life. Look at everything. It's light everywhere. The tiny little things that we pass every day, the macro possibilities in these rainforests. These are flowers. I don't even know what the heck they are, but they're beautiful. So I photographed them. They're all over the place. Little sweet lips plants. You look at things like, you know, here I am photographing this butterfly on the end of a stick. It looks pretty drab, right? It's just a drab butterfly on a stick. But you know, when you use a macro light and a macro lens, boom, you can get an interesting, it makes it a little different. It's a little different. You're looking at a different perspective. You want to open up a different world. Macro photography is a, a talk within itself. It's really fantastic because it's fantastic to shoot. Look beyond the obvious. Here we see the flower, but if we look closer at the flower, there's life on the flower. Okay, there's little things. There's different levels of life everywhere. Don't always look for the big things. It's the little things that can make sometimes the most interesting images. Leaf cutter ants all over the place. Jeez, these, this thing here, I don't even know what it is. It just looks freaky, so I took a picture of it. Um, praying mantises, look at nature. You want to see how nature does things? Look at this, folks. Look at the wings on that praying mantis, just like a dead leaf. How does nature do that? That's incredible that it can mimic things that way so it blends in so it can be an effective predator. Oh, Jiminy Cricket, I don't know what the hell it is. Little, 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 little frogs, little leaf litter toads, they're tiny. These are tiny little frogs. People don't realize how tiny they are. So what I do is I try to tell people, if I have someone with me, I say, let's put that thing on your thumb so I can see how big it is. And there's my, my worker with it on her thumb. This thing all of a sudden went to these gradually fade in, fade out. It's okay. Um, but you see how small it is, okay? Oh, little hard again. Red-eyed tree fox. Look at this thing in the middle of the night. You don't see it unless you go out at nighttime. Because in the daytime, they cover their eyes, they close their eyes, they put their legs and their toes underneath. So all you have is a little green bump on a leaf. But when they come out at night, the color is amazing. That's not photoshopped at all. That's a strobe with a little headlight in the nighttime on a banana leaf in Panama. Boom, look at that thing. That thing looks like somebody spray painted it. But that's nature. That's the beauty of it. That's what I love about it. Hummingbirds. Oh, geez, what an exercise of futility. Every one of these pictures you see, at least of the ones flying, there's about 4,000 that I didn't use because they're all out of focus, okay? But when you look at hummingbirds flying around, oh my God, they call it hummingbirds because they humming. But it's like, I'm going like crap, crap, crap. I mean, that's what I go through the whole time. But it's, 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 better than a, it's better than a video game, guys. It really is, because you get your hand-eye coordination. You move it around in the challenge. And when you get the shot, oh, geez. And his shot here, look at that. That shot, you think I'm a great technical person. But like, oh, how'd you do the lighting on that? You know why? It's lucky the guy next to me was using a flash. And my frame went off the same time his did. So I got his flash. It was beautiful. That's pure luck. That's nothing about being a good photographer. That's pure luck. Photographers who tell you luck has nothing to do with it. They're so full of themselves that you'll be shot. OK. Look at the camouflage here. Look at this bats. There's three bats here. See, one, two, three bats on there. Look how they blend in. It's fantastic. Look at this. Monkeys, primates in the rainforest. Patience. Never chase animals to get photographs, folks. It doesn't work out for either one of you, OK? Patience. Primates especially. I get in the rainforest. As soon as they see me, I sit still. 
Now, sometimes I get pictures like this because the humidity in the rainforest, you're always fogging up. Let me give you the best piece of equipment you could possibly buy for rainforest photography. Those little battery-powered hair dryers that suck for drying hair, but they're great for drying out your lenses. If you can get one of those things, they're small, they're compact, you can put it in your bag. I'm telling you, you're going to thank me forever when you take your little portable hair dryer, and everybody's still doing this with their lenses because they're fogging up, and you're you get the shots. So this guy would come down. You wait for him. They're curious to come down. This next shot is these two capuchin monkeys. And they were two brothers, I think. And they were looking at me, so I sat down. And you can see they're looking at me. They started throwing seeds down at me and stuff like that. Why isn't he coming after us? Why is he coming after us? So then they started coming back to me. And then you can see one telling the other one, you go check. He's pulling the other one. I'm not making this up. You go check. And the other one said, no, 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 you go check. You go check. And finally, they put their arms around each other. So they go, okay, we'll both go down. So they started going down together with their arms around each other to look at me down in the tree. And then I snapped this uh, image of them as they're both looking at me coming down the tree. <laughs> you have to use the speed light down there because in the canopy, you're always shooting up. You see, some places like in Borneo with the orangutans, they won't let you use the speed light, and then you've got to do all kinds of funky things with your camera with manual to try to get the exposure. But here I always use a speed light because if not, you're going to be severely backlit with whatever you're shooting there. People look at monkeys, oh, monkeys are so cute. Let me tell you something about monkeys. I love animals. I dedicated my life to animals. Monkeys are dirty little people that bite, okay? <laughs> Keep that in mind whenever you see them in the wild because the people look at, oh, look, he's so harmless, he's so innocent. They're not innocent. You can tell by looking at his face, he's thinking something else there. Then I'll show you those teeth, and you go, no, 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 this is not something I want to mess with, okay? Use a speed light down in the forest whenever you can. Here you see I did not use a speed light. Look at the difference when I use a speed light on the same animal. See, it just pops the color. It just makes a really big difference. Now I'm going to show you the greatest single wildlife moment in my life. I was one of only a handful of people at the time that actually was able to scale up 120 feet into a tree and sit in the nest with a harpy eagle with a study that I was doing in the Republic of Panama. And when I got into that nest with a harpy eagle, and I remember looking to my left and I saw this, I'm telling you folks, it rocked my world. It's one of these moments that you never ever forget. This is me up in the tree. I will say at the time, this was filmed back then, I had a Nikon F5 that I put out there and put on a, a timer to get this picture. I got the picture, and as soon as I reached for the camera, it fell off the tree 120 feet down. <laughs> Baby, that sucker kept on working. That's a Beck F5. <laughs> That's the best camera ever. All right. So anyway, so I get to work with the indigenous people. That's the great thing about wildlife photography, too. You get to meet the indigenous cultures. Folks, travel. I will tell you this without any hesitation. I'm a big believer in education. I'm a big believer in school. Both of my kids are in college, and that's was important to me. But there's no single greater education than travel. When you travel and you meet other people, you meet other cultures, it'll rock your world. I've watched these kids grow up. I've watched this village for 20 years. And I've watched, I knew these girls when they were little tiny babies. I have photographs of them when they were babies, OK? To grow up with these people, to look at their cultures, my god, it's just unbelievable. I hate photographing people, but I love photographing indigenous people. There's an innocence to them. There's a beauty to them. I just can't get over it. Just, you know, again, the natural light, the, the, I don't know, I get beside myself. Here's the Amazon in the morning. And on the Amazon River, you see the steam coming up, the building of the new village here. You see them catching. And then you see a little river dolphin, the river dolphin. I didn't even notice that until I looked back in my frame. You think I saw that when I took the picture? No, I didn't see that. I only saw it when I looked at my computer screen. River dolphins there because they're pulling up the fishing nets, and the dolphins learn very quickly. These are where the fish come in, so then we get a little smorgasbord here. It works out really well. That's how you can get those shots. That's why I got to be able to aim, shoot, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Try to show perspective again of size. People look at these lilies and don't realize how big they are until I put myself next to one. You realize how big these lilies are. Okay? Piranhas, the big myth about piranhas. I would catch, I did a documentary where we caught piranhas. We we're catching them like as soon as you put the water, piranha, 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 piranha. And then what I did was I actually went into the water. Now that's not real. That's a fake picture. That's the fish's blood on my finger. It didn't bite me. I'm just being dramatic for a stupid picture. But what I did was I jumped in the water. I jumped in the water and I never got bitten once. I've done it many, many times. There's piranhas all the water. They don't bite you. Now don't go in there bleeding. That's not a good idea. But they're not going to just chop on you because you're in the water. You know, everybody's seen that film of a cow going across, and then three seconds later, it's just a skeleton blowing across. Oh my God, you've got to believe it on the movie stuff. Another thing photography does is it brings across the message of what we have to do to protect things. I saw boatload after boatload after boatload of trees like this coming out of the forest. The amount of cutting that's going on, folks, is unbelievable. We have to raise awareness. Images do that better than anything. Images do that, but that's the power that we have as photographers. The light, oh, I'm just going to go through this, because it's just, God, it's, it's endless. I just put it all there. It's just it's gorgeous. You just go have fun. And the night photography you're able to do now because of these ISOs, 6,400 ISO. I just had the guy put a spotlight on the Cayman in the river. It's just fantastic. You can get clear shots hand-holding it on a boat, hand-holding it on a boat with a flashlight. Not a real good flashlight either, kind of a cheap flashlight, okay? You know, owl monkeys. I mean, okay, then I'm going to India. My greatest dream ever since a kid was to be able to see a tiger in the wild. Would I ever be able to see a tiger in the wild? So I went to India to do that, and here I am up in Bandev Gar, up at the top of the park here. You're so high, you're looking down at the vultures. I'm walking. We walked up here. We walked up to Bandev Gar. I have one guide with me to find tigers on foot, no gun, in areas where tigers are. I'm going, you sure this is okay? This, this will be fine. So 
I'm looking down, the vultures are flying below me, and we go up. Look at the camouflage here, folks. Look at that owl, how it's in the tree, blends in with the tree. But you want to see a better one? Look at this species of owl. Look at this. The lines of the tree go into the owl. This is nature, man. This is unbelievable. You can't buy this kind of incredible stuff. That's how fantastic it is. Here you go. You want to talk about expressions in animals? Do they show emotions? Here you see a chittle deer. He's getting his ears picked out of the ticks by the minor bird. He's happy, right? Ah, here we are at the deer spa getting the ticks peered out. This next one just saw a tiger, okay? And that's how we find tigers. When we're tracking tigers in the wild, we listen for the monkeys and the deer to alarm. They alarm them. Like that. Look at this guy who just saw a tiger and tell me, if you can't tell by his eyes, he's a little stressed. He's like, oh, God, okay? That's the way it is, but this is what you get with a still picture that you might not see really in a video. I'm here to tell you, I know everybody's in a video now. It's all video, video, video. No, folks, there are things that you will still see in still photography that you won't see in a video taken of the same exact thing. That's the beauty of still photography. We went up and we saw this old ruin. That's the great thing about India. You go in these places that are ruins that in a place like the United States that have a red velvet rope around it, you're not even able to touch it, no flash pictures, nothing. And this, there's nothing there. You walk into it. And I walked in and I go, oh, what's in there? He goes, no, you do not want to go in there. I go, no, I do. This is fantastic. It's smelled it, ammonia smell, and it's pitch black, pitch black in there. But I put my camera on automatic, right, with the speed light on there. I get in, urine is falling on my face, feces is falling on my face. I shoot up, what is it? It's bats. Look at all those bats. Folks, you haven't lived till you felt that. You go into a dark place like that and you feel that happen. No, I'm serious. It's fantastic. But we're looking for tigers. So here you got a tiger track here and walk into the tiger and I'm saying, this is a tiger. We found it. I go, how close? He's very close, He's very close. Okay, how close? Well, let's check here. Then I saw this. Boom! Oh my God! And I touched it. It was still hot. That thing came right out of its butt. This tiger is right here. He's going, he is watching us. He is watching us now. I go, oh God, oh God. So my adrenaline's rushing, right? Am I going to see a tiger or is the tiger going to see me first? No, there's no question. He has seen you first. I go, oh my God. Okay. And then all of a sudden he grabs me by the arm and goes, damn. I go, where? I'm just looking at bamboo. There's a bunch of bamboo in front of me. But you know, when you look at bamboo and all of a sudden your eyes focus, you go, wait a minute. This picture stinks. This is not a picture you're doing anything with. But in the context of this story, you look at it and you go, oh, he's there. There's a flipping tiger there. And then I waited there. He goes, just wait. I go, is he going to charge us? No, he will not charge. Just wait. I go, okay. I'm sitting there with my hand on the shoulder and he just lowers his look and he looks at you. Folks, this picture is not super sharp. It's through a bunch of weeds. I'm racking out a bunch of things. I love this image because this was a moment of my life that I will never forget. And here's my favorite saying in life, don't you ever forget it, because I'm telling you it should define what your life should be like too. Life is not defined by the number of breaths that you take, it's defined by the number of times your breath is taken away. When you have a moment like this and you go, ah, that's when you feel the most alive. You need to have that. I'd rather live 50 years of a bunch of those <gasps> moments than 100 years sitting in a television with a remote control. Okay, these are the things that make photography great. You get to preserve those times and go out looking at them, tracking them on elephant back, photographing them in the forest. My God, it was just a dream come true. It was unbelievable. I saw so many, not so many, I saw about nine tigers, which was pretty incredible. This tiger's walking right next to me. I'm on the elephant and I'm like this. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You know, and here I am. I'm a zoologist. I've been trained for 30 years and still I feel like a little kid. You feel like a little kid. You're out there. You can't believe you're doing this. I'm the son of a Cuban immigrant who grew up in a little apartment in Jackson Heights and I'm in India photographing tigers. These are the things that photography can open doors for. You at. This was the picture, the last one I took of the guy uh, that evening, last, before I left India, just going across the walkway there, the, the, the dirt road as the sunset. Just perfect. Oh, now we go out to the cold. We go from humid to cold. Polar bears, right? Yes, gorgeous. Wow, beautiful. I love polar bears. So remember now, you want to photograph polar bears considering the white. Because if you don't, you get this. That's pure meter. That's putting it without the meter, without compensating for the white. So I got gray bears, gray snow. Looks like they're in soot. Looks like they're in a polluted area. You want to get the whites. So you want to make sure you compensate for that. People look at these guys all the time with their big glasses. Oh, see, I'm never going to get pictures like them. You know what? That's not really true. Don't be so put aside by all these guys with these $10,000 lenses. Because you know what? These guys are getting good pictures too. Okay? Everybody's getting good pictures here. All you need to do is try. Just take your camera out. Some of these compacts. Nikon has a compact, a, a, a cool pix that goes from 24 to 2,000 optical zoom. It's like, I'm flipping believable. I've been using it the last few days. I'm going, why am I carrying around this big long since when I got this little thing I can put around my shoulder? Fantastic. Okay? Have fun with it. I'm going to go through this real quickly because I know I'm running out of time. Oh my God, I'm so running out of time and I got to tell you the best story ever. So let me go through these polar bears. Okay, boom, polar bears. Oh, that's the other thing. Look, let me show you this. This goes back. Always show the environment. Remember, we're trying to concentrate on the polar bear. Show that environment. Show them walking in a frame. Show that you're out there in Churchill. You're looking at this stuff. Man, if you pay that kind of money for a trip, make sure people know you didn't take it at the zoo. Do that, okay? All right. Alaska. Oh, my God. It's like another land. 
None of these images, I don't doctor my images. I crop, I sharpen, but I do nothing else, really don't, okay? So this is pure color, the way it is out of the film. It's like another world. You watch these, these uh, gl glaciers calve, uh, you see the color. It looks like it's a fake black and white, like I selectively colored blue. No, that's right out of the camera. It's another world, man, it's beautiful. The icebergs, the shapes, the colors, the sizes. Oh my God, you can go on forever, I'm so out of time. Animals, remember, don't chase animals. The seal saw us, went right in the water. I told the jet, turn off the motor. Stop, wait here. Wow, why, he left. Just wait here. I waited. About 10, 15 minutes later, all of a sudden he shows up with a buddy right next to the boat. I'm not joking. He's right next to the boat. And then we didn't do anything. Just be still. I'm just taking pictures like this. Cluck, don't move, don't move. And then he started throwing water on the boat. He would start lifting, flipping water on the boat. Okay? This is fun stuff. You realize you're having an interaction here without stressing the animal, without chasing the animal away. This is the beauty of it. Whales, listen, I'm embarrassed. I'm, I'm going to show you really crappy pictures of whales. But for me, they're great pictures. For me, because I'm not flip, nick, flip nickeling. I don't, yeah, I don't spend my life under the water. I don't have, I've done this just a few times. My thing is mostly terrestrial animals. But I was out there. The day was crappy. It was raining. It was cloudy. I said, oh, my God. But so what? I'm getting the whales. I'm getting the tails coming out. I'm seeing these whales. I put it next to things to show size. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, you get the whale flute. And you come out. Said, now, you know what? I want that picture of that whale coming out of the water, breaching, OK? Oh, this boat captain says, well, you know, they do it every now and then, but you got to be ready. You know, and sure enough, he started to do it one time. But you keep missing. Oh, oh, no, no, Achoo. but then he starts going, he starts going, he starts seeing a little bit of a rhythm, and he goes, okay, boom, oh, God, but he's going the wrong way here, come on, God, no, no. oh, that's close, but really, God, I really, I'd like to have a good port, you know, a good side view like this, I talk to God a lot when I'm photographing, all the time, it's, oh, God, please, just me with it, and then all of a sudden, you sit there, and you, oh, baby, he comes right next to the side of the boat, a totally horrible day, no light, no nothing, you know what, it's not a National Geo picture, but for me, it's heaven. It's heaven because it's the moment that whale came up on the side of the boat and made me feel so amazing. That's what photography's got to do. It's got to make you feel happy first, then worry about everybody else. Okay, bald eagles. Oh my gosh, bald eagles in Alaska like food, you know, doing pigeons in Manhattan. Um, they're all over the place. The great thing now is with this new, this is all handheld. You know, you got these eagles flying through in dark areas, dark forests, no strobe, no nothing, because you're not allowed to use it. This is a place called Anand Creek in Alaska. You get these shots now because this ISO enables you to get the speed that you have. Black bears, remember, you don't want them to be gray bears, so you got to stop down to get the black bear. They'll come by you in the Anand Creek. You can get to a blind, and they're in the blind, and in the blind, they'll walk by you, and they're eating the salmon. Look at the salmon. It's like thick. You can walk over them, okay? And these bears smell like a dog that have tuna kiss tuna fish can squirt all over the top. They stink so bad. But it's fantastic because they're just going out to the salmon. And they just go in, they dip their head in, they get the salmon. You see them come down with their cubs, they grab the salmon, they show it to the cubs. It's fantastic. You see the, the grizzlies come in, they get the, and it's right in front of you. And they don't care about you. Trust me. I'm right next to them in the blind. They're not even paying attention to the click of the camera. They're just getting fish after fish after fish after fish after fish. It's a fantastic, fantastic experience. Glacier National Park, shooting these uh, mountain goats. I always, but I said, you, you know, you want to get a mountain goat to show where you're at. If you've ever been to Glacier, you know that that road to the sun, it's got that great view that goes down the whole Glacier National Park. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, oh God, you know what, it'd be great. I hear him sitting here with a wide angle. If I could have a goat coming into like, with the whole thing behind you there. And I'm saying, talk to God a lot when you do this because it works. And all of a sudden I hear click, 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 click. And boom, this is with a 20, a 20 wide. This, this goat is as close as I am to you. I'm sitting there, he just walked right in front of me, looked at me, goes, there's your picture with the whole Glacier National Park behind him. So then I got greedy. I said, listen, there was this one cliff right here overlooking the valley. I said, oh, God, if you can get him to walk right to the edge of this cliff, because it was like a 1,000-foot drop right there. And I'm sitting there. I'm exhausted. I'm from Miami. I'm up at 8,000 feet. I'm like, <laughs> and all of a sudden, this goat walks on the end. And I said, oh, before God, before you send the goat over there, can you send a cloud over? Because the lightning's a little harsh. Get a little diffuser right here. <laughs> Boom, he did it. Look at that shot. Looking over the cliff, looking at the valley. My God, you're in heaven. And that photograph reminds me of the time I was there every time I shot. Africa, Mecca, this is where we finish with a bang, baby. Mecca, I'm telling you, Africa is great. I work with cheetahs and do a lot of work. Cheetahs are not as nice as everybody thinks they are, but they're not the monsters people think they are either. Remember, there's never been a cheetah that's attacked a human being in the wild. Looking at things like the great migration. My God, you get down there. You watch them line up along the river. You watch them push until one goes in. And everybody thinks it's the crocodiles that are killing these guys, right? It's not the crocodiles. They're drowning in the water. They're jumping over each other because they're panicking. Crocodiles get a few of them, but not the majority of them. As they all start going in, all of a sudden you hear, rah, 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 and they're splashing. It's very stressful to watch. You can look the panic on their faces. They're coming across the river, and you think it's the crocodiles. You see them lined up there. They're like little U-boats, but they're waiting. The crocodiles are going, these guys are going to die anyway. We'll get them when they're dead. So they do that a lot. They always show you the one with the crocodile getting the one, but they don't show you the one with the crocodiles just waiting there, and they wait for the ones to die, and then they get starting to the dead ones, okay? They try to make it so sensationalized a lot of time. It's really not that way, okay? Look, they're jumping. These are all dead wildebeests. 
This guy is jumping over wildebeest that have already died from drowning, from drowning on, the, on their own bodies, okay? All right, most dangerous animal in Africa, the hippo. My only time I ever, well, there's two times I almost got killed. This is one of them. Hippos usually give signs, okay? I've studied hippos a lot. What they'll do is they'll look in the water. If you, if they, they, you feel a little of a threat, he raises his body up a little bit. Feel a little bit more of a threat, he lifts his head out of the water. Feel more of a threat, he opens his mouth, gives you a threat. Another threat, bed, body, everything mouth wide open. So that's five steps. This guy skipped steps two through four, okay? <laughs> so here I am getting a shot. I'm waiting for steps two and three and four. Well, he went straight to step five. And he came lunging at me out of the boat. And I'm sitting there. I'm lying down on water levels and trying to get that water level perspective. And he went out and I went, oh, I got it. We go, we just got away. This thing came at us like a flipping uh, white shark. I don't know what the heck it was. But it was unbelievable. We get back to camp. I'm trying to catch my breath. I go, oh, my God. Oh my God. So I'm looking through the image and I go, oh, I didn't realize. He scared me so badly when he jumped out of the water. I must have hit the shutter. I didn't do it consciously, I can promise you that. I didn't, but look, the camera did all the work. I got him coming out of the water after me. But this is when he made me urinate on myself because this was an amazing moment. He came out of the water. But again, this is where you feel the most alive. When you're almost dead is when you feel the most alive. Fantastic. This is a funny picture. Oh, look how cute that hippo's being. That hippo's not being cute at all. That hippo was sleeping on his mother's butt. But if you look here, that's all feces. The mother just crapped all into his face. And the hippo's kind of going, oh, mom, just like that. But that's when you need to be ready. You need to be ready with the shot. That's, why, that's a great thing. You can't predict this stuff. It's fantastic. The gorillas. You heard about the third. I've worked with gorillas in captivity in the wild for 30 years, folks. I've been very privileged to go several times to see the gorillas. Here I am, this poor guy, this poor porter is carrying my 500 F4 on his head through the jungle. I, this is my first time. I didn't know what I was going to need. You don't need to bring a 500 if you're going to see the gorillas, I promise you, okay? Um, we get through this forest, you get to this beautiful area, and all of a sudden the guy goes, there. And you look and you realize you're being watched. These are moments you never forget, folks. Even today, this is years later, I look at this image, I remember it. I remember that feeling when you felt so alive. And then you look at the families, you're able to look at them. And then there was this one guy named Gahunda, one of the largest gorillas ever documented in Rwanda. And we're going down a volcano, except he was down on a, on a, like it was a steep mountainside. But I wanted the picture, so I gave my other camera body to the porter. I said, listen, you just keep shooting pictures. If I fall and this gorilla kills me, keep shooting, because I want people to know I went out big, okay? <laughs> So I'm down there, and I'm looking at this guy, and there he is. He's right below me. Go under. He's under. And this is really steep, man, and I'm shooting. So as soon as he hears the clitter, the, the uh, shutter click, he looks up at me. And that's when I get that shot here. This is back in the film days, too. And man, it's so powerful. And he got up, and he sat right next to me. You can't use speed lights or flash there. So I couldn't pluck out those eyes or anything. But to have this massive, gentle giant sitting next to you and realizing how lucky you are to be there. Folks, again, I could die tomorrow, and no one should shed a tear for me. And I try to tell people all the time, go out and live these experiences. Don't be saving up for a rainy day. I tell people, it is flipping raining, guys. Get out there and do these things. No one has ever been buried with their money in their coffin, okay? Go out there and live these dreams because those are the things that will define your life. She came right up next to me. This female came right up next to me. I got a wide-angle lens. You know, you're know, you not supposed to look at the gorillas. It's a visual threat. You look at them, but you're not supposed to run away from them. You're supposed to try to keep 10 to 15 foot distance between them and you for zoonotic disease purposes. But basically, if they come at you, you don't run because that's the worst thing. So you just huddle in a fetal position. I had that wide-angle lens. Put his face right next to me. I took that picture like that. I felt his whiskers. He's going, man, you never feel more alive than that. Let me tell you. Then I go to this cave. This cave was fantastic. I go, what's in that cave? My guy goes, oh no, you do not want to go in there. I go, no, I do. When you tell me I don't, that means I do. So I go in there. You thought the other gate, the other, the other thing with bats was cool. Look at this one. This is probably a million bats in there. A million. And these are the big fruit bats. Look at the size of these babies. Oh my God, it was fantastic. I was going, the guano was coming up to my knees. Think about how much money I could have made with all that fertilizer in there. Now we finished off with Botswana. This is the greatest. I know I'm a little late, but this is going to be worth it. This last story is the best one. So I, Botswana is great. Shoot a Botswana. Okay, let's go through Botswana. Little frogs everywhere. Okay, let's go. I want to get to the fun story, the good story. Oh, a lot of question roller. Most photographed bird in Africa. But you know what? You want to get that baby when it's flying. You remember what I told you? Oh, I didn't tell you this. I told the other class this. Blue. Oh, no, I did tell you this. Blue is refracted light. So when an animal flies, the secondary feathers of the lilac breasted roller are fantastic in color, but they fly pretty quickly, and they're not a real big bird, so it's a bit of a challenge. But man, if you time it right, boom, get that color. It's fantastic. I love it. OK, look at that bird. Brown-headed snakey looking down at me. What do I do? I saw him on a stag. I put my hand on the shutter. I just walked, and as soon as he just bent his knees like he was going to fly, you jumped to him, and when you got the right image with the wings spread perfectly, the eyes looking right at you, boom, that's your image. The camera did the work. I didn't get that shot. The camera did the work. All right. Lions, the lions of the Okavango. They make the lions of every place else look like freaking little tabbies. The, these are the biggest, strongest lions I've ever seen. Lions anywhere else. You go to Kenya, Tanzania, lion steps in water, and they're like, oh, God, they got cooties, okay? These lions in the Okavango Delta, they live in the water, so they swim through the water all the time. They don't necessarily like swimming in the water. You can tell sometimes by looking at their face. They're not happy about the water situation. But this next guy is cool. The male, he knew. He says, listen, to keep the cool factor going on, you can't get the tuft of your tail wet. 
because that takes away the cool factor. This guy always swam and always managed to keep the tail out of the water. He was fantastic when he swam in deep water, he said. So I tracked these guys and I watched them hunt. And the females went off and they started hunting together and they went after, they go after buffalo, Cape buffalo in the Okavango in Botswana, whereas most lions don't like to mess with the buffalo. And these buffalo went out, whoa, because they're big herds, you can't take them down. And they realized this. So I watched these lions track these buffalo down. And what they did was they broke off. They got in a huddle and they broke off and we followed just the one lioness. And she would make herself visible and she kept moving the herd. And the herd kept getting smaller and smaller as they kept on splitting up. And I realized what she was doing. She was leading the herd to a certain place where they could make the hunt. And what she did was when she got to that place, she made them see there, okay? And then she got there and she separated. Now instead of 200 buffalo, there are only about 25 there. And she would go up close to them and make them chase her. Because they would chase her. I'll kill you. And she'd run on her way. The first time, eight or nine of them would chase her. She'd do it again. This time, six would chase her. Then she did it once where only two chased her. Now she had separated two from the rest of the herd. And then all of a sudden, like everybody said, now, lions came out of everywhere. All of a sudden, you got these two separated. Now there's a lion over here. There's a lion over here. And they're coming out from my back too. All these lions in the herd. Just the one left over, that's all it takes. Boom, and they're on her. I mean, it's incredible to see this power. All the other buffalo are out of there. They're not going to come back and defend it because they separated. They take this buffalo down. It's incredible to watch. It's just such a moment, folks. It's such an adrenaline rush. And then you watch these lions, and they don't start eating right away. Lions will wait till the kill, till the animal is dead. And what they'll do is you'll see them, they'll sit there, and after the last breath is taken, it's like, okay, and they congratulate each other. They rub their heads against each other and say, good job, and then they start eating, and then they get all kind of animalistic. And you see them doing that, start eating, fighting over the food. It's fantastic. This is one of my favorites. They just killed this, this uh, wildebeest. And lions, you know, in the lion society, lion culture, what they do is the male eats first, then the females, and then the older cubs, younger cubs, and the very youngest one eats last. If there's nothing left, tough, he'll die. That's why lion mortality is so high in cubs. So here you see this guy. You see the guy in the upper left-hand corner here. Every time he came in to try to eat, he got the crap swatted out of him. <laughs> oh, okay. So he finally figured out, I'm not going to eat because I keep getting beat up. Well, then these guys all finished what they were eating because it was during the migration. There was like an abundance of food. And they all go and they fall asleep on their backs. And then this guy's done there and this carcass, most of it's still left there. I said, okay, I'm ready. I'm packing up my bags. I put my cameras in the bag and I'm getting ready to walk away. And I hear, ah, ah. And I look at that cub in the corner. He's looking at me like, hey, 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 hey. Don't put your camera away yet. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not making this up. And I'm sitting there. What the hell? And my driver goes, wait, let's see what he wants. So we sit there, and he does like that. You ever see Lion King? I can't wait to be king, that thing. Well, he can't wait to be king. He walks around the backside of that carcass of the wildebeest. He gets right up to the head. I'm not making this up. He puts his arm around the head. He looks up at me. He goes, now you got your picture. <laughs> this is how much fun you can have when you take that high habit. Okay, lions. Okay, now we're going to finish up. This is it. This is the greatest story. In the history of my wildlife photography career, the greatest single evening I had. Wild dogs, I've done a lot of work with wild dogs in Africa. I've done things in setting up remote cameras and stuff, watching them hunt. Watching them. This is one evening in a place called Salinda. And these dogs are hunting, and we're watching, they're going through this whole thing where they go through this whole socializing and stuff like that. And it's a very distinct hierarchy that's, a, that's set up. You can see here, this is the dominant dog in the center. You see all the submissive looks from the other dogs. The hierarchy is very important because only the dominant female and dominant male mate. They can have up to 16 puppies at one time, but only that female is going to have puppies. The rest of the pack is responsible for caring for all these puppies. But they were going after this Impala. So we watch him going, and this Impala does through all this stuff to try to disorient them as he's running away. But these dogs are coming out like freaking super dogs. Horrible light, right? No, because I don't care if it's horrible light. This is a great story. So this, these, these guys are coming out, and they're running, and they're running. And all of a sudden, now the light is going down. It's sunset, but I got backlit. So it's a sunset. We watch them, and I watched them. They killed it. I didn't put the real kill there because that was a little too gruesome. This is amazing. I'm thinking, oh my God, not only have I seen wild dogs, I've watched them make a kill. I'm documenting this whole thing. I could, can't get any better than this. It's phenomenal. And they're eating this thing and they're tearing it up. And this one dog's always on a look and I look at And all of a sudden they look up and I go, hey, what's going on? I look over my shoulder. It's a hyena. A hyena's coming in. This is great. This is like a National Geographic. They're eating the thing. The hyena's going, the hyena goes, it's just one of me. It's the five of them. Okay, I'm cool. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to wait for backup. I go, oh my God, this is great. So we're watching the dog. The sun is perfect. The sun is setting. It's great light. I'm looking at the light behind me. This is fantastic. They continue eating. And they make this noise when wild dogs eat it. It's an amazing noise. It's really phenomenal to listen to. And they're tearing this thing up. And then all of a sudden he looks up and goes, huh? Looks over his shoulder. It's a lion! A lion's coming from across. And you think, well, there's water there. In Kenya, that would be a big, big barrier. In Botswana, it's not. So this lioness is coming across the water. Boom! I'm coming to get that. So I line myself up right behind the dogs with the kill because I know she's going to run right at that kill. And she's running right at me. And there's the picture that freaking shutterbug ruined for me. And then we come across. <laughs> she blows right by me. Boom! She's blowing by me. Look at this. 
3,200 ISO, handheld. Boom, the dogs run away. The dogs go, we're not going to fight this lion. So we're running away. The sun is setting. The dogs are ticked off. This one dog is like, I can't believe this lion is coming over here. The lion goes, tough. The lion comes in, takes the food, sits there, and starts eating the food. I'm thinking, oh my God, this is a National Geographic moment. Dogs kill, eat. Hyena comes in. Hyena gets rebuffed. Lion comes in. Lion takes away. Could it get any better than this? Lion just looks up and goes, huh? It's a leopard! A leopard comes out of the bush! And this leopard comes out of the bush, and he's looking at him, going, oh my god, I can't believe it! I got hyena over here, I got dogs over there, I got a lion eating here, and I got a leopard coming in. And the leopard goes, oh my god, smells good. Oh yeah, smells real good. But you know what? I'm not going to take that lioness. I'm going to wait here, see if there's any leftovers when I'm done. So now the sun is setting. I'm thinking nothing can get any better than this, right? I've seen everything now. This is unbelievable. As the sun sets, darkness falls in, this lioness is still finishing up, and then all of a sudden I hear, a bunch of hyenas come in out of the dark. The backups come, and the backups challenge this lioness, and they take the food away from the lioness. I'm going, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. Please shoot me now. I'm done. I'm done. Just put a fork in me. And then these lions, so now I'm looking. I'm like, why are the hyenas stopping? Why are they smelling? Why are they smelling? There can't be anything else that can happen here. I've seen all the predators, hyenas, dogs, lions, leopards. That's it. What else is there? A crocodile comes out of the water. <laughs> this is a crocodile. It's the single greatest night ever in the history of photography. This is a documentary happened here in three hours. He came and took the food away. The hyenas tried to brought out the crocodile. The crocodile got the rest of it, went back in the water. Single greatest evening ever in Africa. <laughs> leopards always want to be seen. That's when you see them. They're very common. I've watched these leopards make incredible moves, incredible kills. 6,400 ISO, handheld. 6,400 ISO. It's a lot darker than it looks in that picture. Trust me. The sun is already set. This is Lacodema. Anybody ever seen the uh, documentary? Uh, what about the leopard? The, um, I figured the eye of the leopard, whatever. This is Lacodema. You always want to, as a wildlife photographer, you want to get a picture that shows an animal that's not stressed. This is Lacodema. She was one of my stars. I watched growing that, watching that documentary. And she then leaned over and just looked at me. And these are the moments you want as a wildlife photographer. When you know an animal's relaxed, you know you're not making a difference, you're not stressing the animal out. It's a beautiful thing. I talk about patience, folks. We watched this leopard make a kill, and I told my wife, we're sitting in the truck, and this leopard made a kill and left the kill at the bottom of the termite mound. I said, she's got cubs. My wife goes, okay, let's wait. So I'm waiting. I'm waiting. 15 minutes goes by, and all of a sudden, you hear my wife in the background. She does one of these. She goes, <sighs> that's my wife saying, how long are we going to stay here waiting for something that's not going to happen? I go, listen, honey, I know she's got cubs. So we wait, we wait, we wait, and then all of a sudden, folks, about a half an hour later, boom, the cub comes up. Boom, you get these shots like this, and you sit there, you go, oh, my God. And then you get the money shot where you walks up and you do this. Oh, please, God. This is the greatest thing ever. We, do, we have the greatest hobby in the world. Patience, folks. You look at a shot like this, you go, that's not going to be any good. Look at them. They're lazy. They're sleeping. You never know. They may stand up like they're posing for you. It depends. You just got to wait. This is the last shot I'm going to show you. This was the greatest thing. This is a cheetah. I remember I did cheetah. I still do cheetah research and conservation work. This is a very famous cheetah in a place called Quandi who historically raises five cubs to adulthood every season. Unheard of in cheetahs. Usually not even one can make it to adulthood. Cheetahs have such a high mortality rate, but she's such a great mom. We found her, and we found her with the five cubs almost at adult size already. I think, oh my God, this is great, but they're in thick brush. I couldn't get a picture of them, so I just waited. And then they went up on a termite mound as a side of the I said, oh my God, great, and I got the shot. So that's when you get the one in the can. Everybody wants to get the one in the can to prove you were there. So you see the mom here, and you see her five cubs. I got them all, but that's when I start talking to God again. I go, God, I really need a picture of them, maybe looking at me a little bit more. You can't make any noise. You don't do this. You don't want to stress the animal. They go, oh, okay, this one's yawning, but now the other one's hiding in the back. Oh, God, please, no, that's not. They're looking the wrong way. Oh, that's a lot closer, God. That really is a lot closer. Please, please. Oh, God, just a little bit more. I promise if you give me this one, I'll never ask for another one again. Boom, and you get it. Let me tell you something, folks. I've already spoken too long. Pick up your cameras, whether it's in your own backyard, or whether it's at Central Park, whether it's at the Bronx Zoo. There's wildlife everywhere. Enjoy yourself. Remember, the only person you really have to satisfy first is yourself. Thank you very, very much. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.